Recently, I had an opportunity to discuss successfully growing organic potatoes at home with an expert, Jim from Wood Prairie Family Farm. I'm a huge fan of their products. I've been buying my own seed potato from them for several years and have had great success. But after talking with Jim, I'm an even bigger fan. His attitudes on and practices of organic, sustainable, regenerative farming practices are equally amazing and important. So if you wanna hear from the expert on how to successfully grow your own organic potatoes, keep watching. Jim, I am super excited to be interviewing you today. I'm a huge fan of Wood Prairie Farms products. I found you guys a few years ago. I've had great success with your seed potatoes and I get asked a lot where I buy them. So I am very happy to be talking to the potato expert today. So if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and giving me a brief history of your farm, what you grow, um, where you are, the family business, Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm Jim Gerritsen. Uh, my wife, Megan, and I started the farm 47 years ago. We're located in northern Maine in the unorganized territories of uh, northern Maine. And we have an isolated farm, which is perfect for growing organic seeds. So that's what we specialize in growing. And the main crop that we grow is organic seed potatoes. And about uh, 35 years ago, we started up this mail order, then mail order business, now mail order web business, to where we have customers in all 50 states. And uh, we ship seed potatoes um, 10 months out of the year from the time we start harvesting in September, right through the winter until the 4th of July. And uh, so we started the farm. We've been focused on growing um organic seed, but over the years, we sold at the farmer's market for 10 years back in the 80s, 40 years ago. So we've grown most every type of vegetable that can be grown up here. But now we're focused on growing things like seed potatoes, organic grains like winter rye, oats, uh, wheat, spring wheat, um, and wet seeded vegetable crops, tomatoes, peppers, uh, squash, pumpkin, things like that, that we're able to grow in our short season uh, area in northern Maine. And now uh, the, our son, Caleb, has taken over the farm. We've handed it down to him. So now Megan and I are working for him. I absolutely love that. That's one of the things that drew me to your farm is I love things that are kind of that family business and multi-generational because um, you really do kind of pass down your knowledge. And so we were talking earlier and you told me how, you know, you often think of Idaho as the place for potatoes, but tell me a little bit more about why Maine really is a great place to uh, grow potatoes. Well, uh, before Idaho ever thought of growing a potato, Maine has been growing them for about 200 years uh, up at this end of the state. And in fact, as recently as the early 1950s, uh, Maine was the number one potato producing state in the United States. Uh, we've always been growing uh, seed potatoes. Um, uh, as a state, Maine has had uh, a seed potato certified seed potato program for over 100 years. So at one point, you know, maybe 20 years ago, 25 years ago, half of all the progeny, well, half of all the potatoes grown in the eastern half of the United States were progeny grown from Maine seed. And it's probably a little bit less now as the production has shifted west. But um, Maine has been growing potatoes for a long time. And for uh, over 100 years, uh, farmers and gardeners have looked to Maine to get their seed potatoes. I find this fascinating. I could literally listen to you talk about history of potatoes. <laughs> I love history of crops and heirlooms and just all these things. Um, that I feel like we're kind of losing nowadays, this, this history of crops. But since uh, the channel of mine is really focusing on helping beginner gardeners, those with small gardens who really just want to start growing potatoes or have maybe had some difficulty growing potatoes, let's get into some tips and some common questions that I get. And the most common question I get is, do I need to buy seed potato or can I grow potatoes from the grocery store? Yeah, really, the short answer is you ought to buy your seed potatoes. Um, conventionally raised potatoes, the ones that you would find in the grocery store, uh, have invariably been sprayed with a diluted herbicide called sprout nip. And the design is so that farmers can extend the shipping season on conventional potatoes. So as you might imagine, a potato that has had a herbicide sprayed to it, the uh, sprouts are not going to come out properly. So even if you were to buy organic 
potatoes and what we call table potatoes, meaning uh, potatoes that are designed to be prepared in the kitchen. Um, these, first off, you may not know the variety. They may be marketed as a red or a gold potato, and it could be a great variety. It could be a loser variety. And also, because they those potatoes have not been grown as seed, uh, you don't know what you're getting. And there's uh, two potential impacts. One is the impact on that year's crop that it may not, uh, because it's not highly um, uh, qualified seed, it may not produce that well. And then also you run the risk of introducing some kind of a pathogenic disease into your soil that you may not be able to get rid of. So the safe thing is to plant a uh, certified seed. And if you're, I would say you never want to be more than two generations away from certified seed. Um, uh, modern day commercial potato farmers always buy certified seed. They would never plant uh, seed that wasn't certified because it just cuts down their risk. And modern day farming is risky enough as it is. And what farmers like ourselves have learned is you want to get your hands on the best quality seed, whatever crop you're growing. And that if you do that, you're well on your way to having a successful crop and anything less and you're really increasing the risk of where it isn't worth the risk. I agree. I think, you know, I tell people with potatoes and other things like apples that are kept in like cold storage, you know, they're, they're, they can last for a long time and be safe to eat, but growing them is kind of another, another issue, you know, as the older mm -hmm. they get, the less likely they are to grow as well. Also, I think in buying seed potato, I was just amazed at all the different kinds that you can find. And that's been my biggest thing, especially buying from, from you guys. I've just, some of my favorite varieties, you know, there's no way I could find them in the store. I think last year I grew, um, is it Prairie Blush? And I think that's, that's yeah. um, specific to your farm, correct? Yeah, there's an interesting story there um, in the crop of 2001, so 22 years ago, we found this one uh, plant growing in a field of Yukon gold, and uh, all of the um, the tubers in that hill had a pink blush. And Yukon gold in most soils tends to have a highlighted pink eye. And uh, that's one of the pretty aspects. It's a beautiful potato. But in this case, the um, uh, shading went to a, a third to a half of the uh, skin area. So we held back that uh, the tuber, and then we planted that out the next year, and everything in that hill had this pink blush. So we grew it out a few more years. We brought it up to the potato breeder at the potato experiment station 25 miles away, and they conducted um, tests on it, and they found that it was a distinct variety. It's called a varietal uh, variant or a clonal uh, variant. And eventually we went through the paperwork to get it identified as a new, uh, brand new variety. And the interesting thing, it it does have, uh, because it's a sport off of a uh, Yukon Gold, it does share some of the characteristics, but it tends to be a little bit moister in texture for eating. And it has a higher set, which is one of the limitations of Yukon Gold. The set or the number of tubers per hill is limited in Yukon. Prairie Blush is a little bit better. And it's about five days later in season. And it's probably, we have uh, market growers that have been buying Prairie Blush from us for years. And they tell us that it's the best variety that they've ever tasted and their customers have ever tasted. So we lucked out on that one. And it's kind of the fun thing in gardening. You never know what you might discover, uh, you know, growing in your garden. It's true. And I've grown both Yukon Gold and Prairie Blush. And I love them both for different reasons. Um, but I, I, I will agree with that statement. It was such a delicious um, potato and the, the yield was just crazy on this, the size of them and the amount. I just had such great luck with them. So I'm a huge fan of that one. So on that note, um, most people, when they think of potatoes, they think of a russet potato. They may think of maybe a, a yellow or a, or a golden potato. So we can kind of categorize potatoes in different ways. So we have, you know, determinate and indeterminate. We have um, early versus late. You know, we have russet and fingerling. So what are the few different ways that we can categorize potatoes so, so that when a new gardener is shopping, they kind of understand these terms? Yeah, I, I think if you're, you know, if you're a consumer looking to buy potatoes in the grocery store or at a farmer's market, 
then you're going to be concerned with the issues like, are they russet skin? Do they have a gold skin, a red skin, purple skin? And then the flesh. Is the flesh white or is it gold or is it purple or uh, is it pink? We actually have a variety that has red skin and pink flesh called Adirondack red. So, but if you're a gardener, you can take those um, preferences and then you can actually plug them into, well, what would grow best here? So if you're, you know, there are a lot of considerations, but say if you're in the South where um, it gets hot in the summer, potatoes are a cool season crop. So it doesn't perform well when the temperatures get above 90 degrees. And really when they get over a steady 95 degrees or higher, they may actually keel over and die. So what that means in the North, we grow them over the summertime, but uh, anywhere else, you're gonna grow it on the shoulder seasons trying to avoid that heat. So in the South, you wanna make sure that you plant on time in the spring, and then probably focus on short and mid season varieties so that they'll complete their uh, tuber bulking by the time the hot weather comes along. And then the beauty of, if you are down South, you have the ability to grow a second crop in the fall, planted something like middle of uh, August to middle of September, and then harvest a crop before Thanksgiving. But um, what it comes down to, it's really personal preference. Thankfully, potatoes are a very resilient, uh, non-fussy crop, and it, they do pretty well most anywhere. So you can have fun testing out different varieties. And we often recommend, we always recommend that you try several different varieties so that you find which ones excel in your microclimate. Uh, and then every year you can add one or two. And we, in our catalog, we have a uh, what we call the experimenter special. So you can try up to four different varieties of three tubers each. So in that way, you don't have to spend a lot of money to, to see if a new variety might be something that would be well suited to where you're gardening. And I definitely can second that. So where I am in the Midwest zone 6B, you know, we get both, we get cold winters and we get really hot summers. And I have just found, um, I've tried growing russet potatoes, you know, these long, late, uh, late varieties the last few years, and they really just have not done well for me. Mainly, I think it's the heat. I agree. Once that heat really hits and we're in a high, hu you know, humidity environment, they just don't do well. They kind of just stop growing. Also in that late or mid July when temperatures are at the peak is when the Japanese beetles come out and they just, you know, they love, they love potatoes. <laughs> so I have found for me personally, growing those two crops of early to mid season potatoes has, has been a lot more successful. I have a lot more pests, a lot less pest pressure. Um, and because I live in a human environment, we get fungal issues quite a bit. And in an organic garden, fungal issues can be tricky sometimes to, to treat. Um, so I have found that I just, for me, like you said, those two early to mid season crops do really, really well. So next question is, I know you're on a farm, so you're mostly, I'm assuming, growing in ground. I grow in raised beds and have had pretty good success, but I get a lot of questions from people who say, I don't even have a backyard. The only thing I have is a patio. So can I grow these in grow bags? Can I grow them in containers? What is there really like a best way to grow potatoes? Well, uh, I would say no, that's uh, a reflection of their versatility. They grow well either in, in the ground, in raised beds, or in containers. There are some varieties that grow better in containers. And I'd, I'd say the rule of thumb is this, the more you get away from nature, the more challenging it is to grow. So if you're growing in the ground like we do, those are natural conditions so long as you're not using, you know, um, long-term persistent synthetic inputs like a, a conventional grower would. But um, once you get into raised beds, you know, depending on uh, uh, your methodology, you're starting to get a little bit away from, from how it was done in nature and then uh, containers that much more so. So with containers, we have one variety that one of our um, uh, dropship companies one time tested. They they tested 50 varieties to see which would do best in the containers they were selling. And the variety Elba, a round white variety from Cornell University, uh, named after the town of Elba, New York, uh, that performed the best of all 50 varieties. And it's one of our favorite varieties 
Uh, and it's one when people have never tried uh, container gardening before, that's the first one we go to because here was some good solid research that indicated this one excelled. But it's not the only one you can do in containers, but uh, it's one that does well. And when you're starting out, you want to be successful. So you want to start out with as many uh, uh, of the elements in your favor to try to give you the highest uh, chance for success. And then after that, you can start to experiment with more varieties. I would probably also um, um, advise that with the um, uh, container gardening, the biggest issue uh, seems to be inadequate watering. And you want to make sure that if you've got a um, solid container that you've got drain holes in the bottom so that they don't get too wet. But uh, if you've got like fiber bags now are kind of a popular way to grow things and you can't overwater that because the water just oozes out the sides. But uh, I'd say that most people don't real realize how much water that potatoes go through when they're growing. So you want to make sure that they get adequate water. I think a potato is 85% water. So if they're limited in water, they're not going to uh, size up and you won't have that big of a crop. Yeah, I would say that potatoes, <laughs> I feel like of all the many crops in my garden, some like carrots, you know, they're good with like maybe once a week, same with tomatoes, but potatoes, they, they, they really suck up that water fast. Yeah, yeah. Um, so on that note, I know in containers, we're, we're using things like potting mixes. So we're not really using soil. Um, maybe the same thing for raised bed. I have kind of a mix of topsoil and compost and, and different things in my raised beds. And obviously in ground, we're just having soil with some amendments. So is there a a soil that is best for growing potatoes? And we can kind of touch on things like pH or soil composition, but is there a best soil for growing potatoes? Well, if you look at all of the potato growing regions in the world right now, you know, as agriculture has gotten advanced, it's become much more specialized. So in every potato producing region, northern Maine, Idaho, uh, San Luis Valley in Colorado, we're all growing on sandy loams. So it's an indication that you need um, uh, to let the water um, flow away from the plant and and I, I'd say the all soils, you know, a, a good loam or a sandy loam, those are ideal. What is not ideal is a clay type soil. And if you imagine, you know, uh, uh, one time a farmer described it to me and he said, you know, it's like putting your face in a uh, basin of water. Works good if it's there for, you know, 10 or 15 seconds. Doesn't work good if they're if there for 24 hours. So potatoes like dry feet. And if the uh, ground is so tight with uh, clay content that it's holding water after a rain with the tubers forming, you can get some problems. So if you do have a clay soil, you don't have to give up on growing potatoes, but you're better off lightening it up, mixing some sand in, mixing some peat moss in, mixing some leaves in, uh, anything to lighten that up. And there is a technique which um, it's probably a 50 year old technique now, but uh, many of us read about it in Organic Gardening Magazine. And it, uh, Ruth Stout was the one woman who came up with that. So it's the stout no dig method. And her method was to place the seed uh, piece, seed potato piece right on top of the soil and then apply a deep heavy mulch of 12 to 15 inches of straw. And then the plants will grow through the straw and you might need to paw away the uh, straw so the plant can get a start. But then once it's up through, push that um, uh, mulch over and the potatoes will be set right on top of the ground. So then in the fall for harvest, you simply peel away the straw and your potatoes are right there. So even if you had a clay type soil, uh, your potatoes are not growing in the soil. They're growing in that layer between the soil and the straw. So that might be a good technique. And then the beauty of that is as that straw is decomposing, it's becoming high quality organic matter, which you can then blend into the soil. So that's a nice way, spending some money, getting the straw and then lightening up your soil, which will be good for whatever crop you're growing in the future. 
I agree. I, and that's exactly why I mainly um, garden raised bed. I, I have naturally clay soil where I live. It's also very alkaline. We have a lot of limestone in the soil. Um, and I live in a neighborhood. So we have compacted zero topsoil, you know, clay. And so growing in raised beds has been really beneficial. And if I am growing in ground, it takes me several years to prep that soil. And just for anyone who is watching, who's not uh, um, familiar with the term loam. So we're talking about we have clay and we have silt and we have sand, sand uh, soils and loam is kind of that nice mixture of everything in between. So it has a great balance of holding on to water, but not too much like clay. It has a great balance of draining, but not too much like sand. And so, you know, that's kind of where we want. And that's where issues I think come in when growing in containers is that potting mix isn't really soil. In fact, it's not soil, it's all organic material and it just drains so fast, which is great for a lot of things, but for potatoes that need a lot of water. So I'm hearing clay isn't great because it doesn't drain. And then potting mix is tricky because it drains a lot. So you might have to water more, but if you've got some nice loamy soil, whether in a raised bed or that you've amended, that's a good environment for growing potatoes. So we know that potatoes are heavy feeders. So what would you say um, to the question, do I need to fertilize my potatoes? Well, potatoes are a heavy feeding crop, uh, kind of in the same category as squash and corn. So if you want a good crop, you do need to give it uh, plenty of plant food. And if, you're, if you've got a new garden, it's a pretty easy guess. You're going to need extra fertility. Um, uh, organic gardens, in our experience, it takes three, even five years to build up the fertility from doing things right. And then the beauty of that is you're investing in that and every year you're getting better and better quality soil. You're gonna raise bigger and better crops with higher quality, more nutrient density as you're improving on that. So uh, to me, that's the best investment you can make is putting money into that garden because it's gonna be a long-term investment that you're building on for you and your family. Um, so I would say uh, fertility wise, you wanna put, um, a lot of fertilizer and and if you've had a garden going you know five seven years and you're starting to wonder i wonder if i've got enough fertility now a simple test that we would recommend is say if you've got a, a variety that you're going to grow a couple of rows of in one row add a good quality fertilizer that does well for potatoes and in the other row don't add the fertilizer and then uh, pay attention to the growth during the summer and then come harvest time, measure uh, the harvest out different. And invariably, you'll, you're going to, with a crop like potatoes, you will prove to yourself that the little bit of money you spend on fertility is worth it because you're going to get that much more of a yield. You might get twice as much of a yield for putting down, you know, a few dollars worth of uh, fertilizer, organic fertilizer versus not. So, um, at one extreme, you can uh, over fertilize, but you know, I've read this for 50 years and there have been very few organic farms or gardens that I know of that over fertilize. Usually it's hard for us to get enough fertilizer, especially in a new field or a new garden, uh, but there's a theoretical chance that you could over fertilize and that would prompt the plant to go into vegetative production and really to forget about setting the uh, the new crop of potatoes underneath. But uh, I haven't run into that myself ever. I've never run into any organic farmer that has run into that. So I think it's more of an academic concern, but you do want a lot of fertility, but there is, go like in, in life, there is going overboard if you uh, get carried away. And so are you wanting to use, if you are using an organic fertilizer, are you wanting to use a very balanced fertilizer or do you feel like potatoes need a little bit more nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium? What do they like? Yeah, uh, they go through a lot of potassium and everything needs uh, phosphorus for good cellular action. And because uh, potatoes are relatively high in protein for a vegetable, you do need nitrogen, which is a component of amino acid. So uh, we, we uh, sell in our catalog a, um, a blended fertilizer that's a 426, so NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, 426, that's the percentage. So if you put 100 pounds um, of that fertilizer on, you'd have four pounds of nitrogen, two pounds of phosphorus, and six pounds of potassium. So that's the ratio that uh, that we found that potatoes do particularly well on. Um, 
And then it gets a little complicated because like a lot of soils have plenty of phosphorus in them, but they're not available to plant. So if you can figure out how to make it available. So we use um, something called mycorrhiza fungi, which uh, we apply to the seed and that gives the roots the ability to be colonized by these mycorrhiza fungi. And they take what phosphorus is in the soil and they make it plant available. Um, the other thing in this area, at least they've grown potatoes for long enough that there's probably plenty of potassium in the soil. So you can actually maybe here get by with less potassium because your father and grandfather and great grandfather before had been putting on enough. So, uh, but generally they need basically all three, you know, and the four to six ratio is what we found works really well. So we know potatoes are definitely prone to diseases and pest pressures. And I know you're a certified organic farm. So just for the everyday gardener, what's some of the best ways that they can help prevent either through things like crop rotation or trap crops? Um, what are, what will tell me what's most effective for you? Yeah. Well, uh, first thing is start with the highest quality seed that you can get. And this isn't just potatoes, it's anything you're growing. You always want high quality seed. In the case of potatoes, um, uh, you might have a garden, you might have 30 different vegetables growing in it. And potatoes are going to be in a class of their own because 29 of those vegetables are going to be propagated from what's called true seed, like a, a corn seed or a squash seed but potatoes are propagated vegetatively to where when you buy seed potatoes from us, you're buying um, relatively small tubers that have been checked by inspectors for either total freedom from disease or virtual freedom from disease that could affect your crop. Uh, and those seed tubers uh, do have the possibility of transmitting disease from one generation to the next. So if the seed potatoes that we're gonna be growing this summer here in Maine, that we begin to sell in September and will be planted in the fall through uh, spring and summer of 2024, there is a possibility of transferring disease through. So by getting high quality seed, you're gonna cut down your risk for some of the diseases like uh, some of the bacterial and viral diseases that could affect a, plot, uh, a crop. And in terms of insect pressure, I would say, you know, if you can see the insects like Colorado potato beetles, the most effective way is to simply pick them off with your hands. And up in this area, you know, uh, generations ago, they used to pay the kids a penny a bug and they'd go through the field with a can or a bucket and they'd collect them into their bucket and get, get paid at the end of the morning for uh, having picked them. But, you know, we've... Uh, got experience. We had an isolated seed plot once and we had 600 row feet of one variety. And this is 30 years ago when the Colorado beetles were absolutely horrendous. And uh, I wanted to see if I could maintain control of that simply by picking bugs. And I worked hard at it all summer, would pick the bugs two to three times a week, but I was able to do it and grow a big crop uh, in an era where if you didn't tend to that, you could act, have a completely decimated crop. Uh, so in my opinion, from our own experience, if you're up to several hundred feet, you can pick them and control them. So in a backyard garden, it's still a good way to go. If you've got things like leaf hoppers or Japanese beetle, I think probably the sensible thing is to put netting over your uh, garden to prevent them from getting in. I think that's the most practical way. Uh, leaf hoppers are pretty small, so it needs to be a, a pretty fine uh, mesh. But um, with the climate warming 20 years ago, I had only read about leaf hoppers in the books. Uh, I had never seen them. And now we're now getting them probably four out of five years. Uh, they don't overwinter in Maine, but they overwinter in the uh, Gulf states and then the wind blows them up here. So uh, they're a factor now that we never had to deal with, but uh, they're so small, it's hard to see uh, the damage. But if you're on a, you know, if you're south of Maine and that's virtually everybody, uh, you're going to you're going to see your leaf hoppers before we do. And I think some kind of netting, uh, garden netting that you can have to keep them out of your crop is probably the most practical way. And then you're not having to use any of the uh, poisons. Even some of the organic inputs are 
uh, short-term poisons, but you know you want to be careful with them. And then if it's a broad spectrum material, you're actually hurting some of the beneficials that are helping keep in check the problem. So you know, netting, keeping it out. And we actually do that in, in propagating our own potatoes. We've got a couple of uh, what we call tunnels, but uh, they used to call them greenhouses, but rather than covering them with plastic, we cover them with aphid excluding netting. It's the aphids that will transfer virus from a sick plant to a healthy plant. But in doing this, we've got one tunnel 100 foot long and another tunnel 600 foot long. And we're able to keep those insects out so we can grow a high quality virus free crop in outdoor conditions. And that really allows us to grow some of these unique varieties that are simply not available anywhere else. But uh, uh, anyway, so that's our experience brought down to a kind of a home garden scale. And what about with, because fungus, fungal issues, usually um, septoria leaf spot, pretty much anything that's going to infect a tomato here is going to also get my tomato or potato since they're in both the same family. But um, how do you deal with uh, diseases, maybe with more fungal issues? Well, uh, the, the big, the two big uh, uh, funguses that affect potatoes would be early blight and late blight. And those are slang terms. The fact is you may get late blight before early blight, but Pretty much in the East, late blight is the problem. In the West, early blight is the big problem. Uh, what we found, we used to get uh, early blight maybe up till 30 years ago. And in doing our research on it, we found that it's an opportunistic uh, fungal pathogen. And it would tend to come in and affect late season varieties in early August when they were kind of running out of gas. and. Uh, what we came to perceive is that we hadn't put enough fertility on those late varieties and that when they started to, to senesce a little bit early, uh, the early blight would come in and take them down prematurely. So simply by increasing the amount of fertility uh, on those late varieties, we haven't had a problem with early blight in uh, 30 years now. We're in the East and early blight is a bigger factor out in Idaho and Washington and Oregon out West. Uh, so I'm not saying that this would work there, but here in the East where early blight is not that big a thing, if you've got that problem, I would recommend increasing the fertility to give that plant. It, basically, it's an opportunistic fungus and it preys on a plant that's under stress because it doesn't have enough fertility. Amp up that fertility, make the plant healthy, and it seems to resist that. So then the big one is uh, a potato late blight. And the Irish potato famine of the 1840s, that was caused by this same uh, fungus. Um, the big thing, I think, uh, there, if you've got the wet weather, with any disease um, uh, situation, you've got to have three elements that have to be present in order for a disease to take hold. It's a three-legged stool. If you're lacking any one of them, you won't have the disease. So you've got to have the host. And if you're growing potatoes, you have a host for something like potato late bite. Then you have to have the inoculum. And then you have to have um, the environmental conditions. So if you've got a hot summer, uh, first off, potato late bite likes kind of cool, wet, imagine the Irish countryside, you know, foggy, cool, temperatures between 60 and 73 degrees. Uh, if you've got those conditions and you've got the inoculum present, then you've got to be concerned. But if you don't have the inoculum present, if you're isolated and there's uh, no inoculum, meaning spores coming in from somewhere, uh, then you, you could have the conditions and the host, but not have the disease. All three have to be met. So in the case of uh, late blight, um, as a preventative, organic farmers are allowed to use um, materials like uh, uh, fixed coppers, like copper hydroxide, which has to be sprayed onto the leaf prior to an infection period. But here, um, for the first time in probably 100 years, we haven't really had any blight pressure now for three or four years in Maine because the summers have been turning hot and dry. And in other words, we've been having conditions that are not the correct environmental conditions for late blight, and that's uh, allowed us to be free. So we haven't uh, uh, had any controls that we've had to apply for late blight for three years 
It, it's almost like these are Western conditions that we're now getting in Maine on a regular basis. Then at some point, the pendulum is going to swing and we're going to go back into it. But it's uh, like I say, for probably the first time in 100 years, there hasn't been a concern for late light uh, by the scientists up here that are studying it. Yeah, it's it's really interesting how weather patterns really affect all this. But um, I think our time is about finished. So I just want to thank you so much, Jim, for for letting me kind of meet with you and talk with you, and also just for providing great product. I I love this push that we're moving towards to kind of get away from these farming practices that have been in place for so long. And we're understanding the need for regenerative practices, for sustainable practices, for kind of getting back to um, feeding the soil and not the plants. And I think you're a great example of um, success in doing that. And, and, and the fact that I've had such great results from good quality seed potato from you just is proof of that. So thank you so much. I hope we can talk again in the future and I will leave all the information for Wood Prairie Family Farm in the description box below. And Jim, we will talk to you soon. Okay, Jessica, it's been fun.